All right. Welcome back to this week's Multifamily Roundtable. This week, we have Brian Hay with uh, MultiSouth Management Services out of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, moving to the guest side of the table, we're going to put Dan Kruger, who's normally a co-host under the gun, and, and we're going to be talking about uh, property management this week. And, and Dan does uh, internal property management, whereas Brian is a third-party management company. And so we're going to be talking about the, the similarities and the differences between the two. And uh, so let's start off this week. Brian, if you want to, uh, since you're our guest, you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you live and how long you've been with MultiSouth. Certainly. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, I'm in Moose, Tennessee. And I'm currently in my backyard, as you can see. And I've been with MultiSouth Management Services for about three years, so two and a half, three. Uh, before that, I did some single family investing on my own. I still do that. I've kind of always just been around the multifamily world and eventually decided to jump on over a few years ago. Um, I kind of wanted to be in there long term, a lot like most of y'all I feel probably are. And so I figured I might as well just go ahead and get in and get in with both feet, figured it couldn't hurt. So I really enjoyed it. Um, our company has grown from around 5,500 units when I started, uh, and I think as of today, we're about 12,000, some more coming on. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I enjoy our customer base, and uh, it's fun going to work each day. Very cool. I love it. Um, I'm curious. Sorry, can you guys hear me? We can. Yeah. So do you want to okay. do you want to kind of give the same little spiel? Because I don't know if we've actually heard uh, from you, Dan, as far as units. I don't and... know how to be a guest. I just know how to moderate. This is new. I know. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is, this guest is like mode. The, this is like the second time that we've thrown you <laughs> under the bus on the on the guest side, isn't you, it, Anthony? You guys just like to see me squirm <laughs> in front of the camera and feel uncomfortable. Um, okay. So yeah, my intro, I guess. For the uh, for the guest role would be, um, you know, it's the story that I think we've probably mentioned before with uh, you know how me and Anthony got started. Uh, I started uh, investing in 2018, uh, acquired my own properties for the first year, and then started getting more into the syndication uh, side of things. Um, first property I purchased, I tried outsourcing the management to a, a third party company. After about six seven months, figured that just wasn't a good fit for me. So decided to ax them and then uh, take it in-house and just be a vertically integrated organization and keep that aspect in-house as opposed to outsourcing it to a third uh, party company. And so yeah, we've been, uh, Anthony actually started investing before me. I started in 2018, he and I teamed up in 2019 uh, and here we're at today. So that's kind of my backstory. That's a good intro, Dan. Hey, real quickly. So I don't I've know if we better. actually talked about what we're discussing here today. But um, we're going to be debating. I'm really excited about this format. This is the first time we've ever done the debate format. So we're going to throw Dan and Brian into the Thunderdome. They're going to go at it, um, trading blows, discussing uh, specifically the pros and the cons of in-house management versus third-party property management. I got to point out that Brian, I think, is already maybe cheating because I see he has a teammate over there. Yeah, it was a furry well, little pooch. So let's no. let's see the teammate. Oh. Yeah, that's the one. Hey. Brian, wins. Brian wins. <laughs> By the way, you didn't tell me that's this awesome. was going to be a debate party versus in house. I wasn't prepared for this at all. I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't bring your gloves. <laughs> Well, that's that's how yeah, we lure people in. We don't tell them there's going to be a, a fight. We just bring them in and then we jump them. I'm going to get these fists. No padding. <laughs> bring it. <laughs> Things are going to get intense. And, I, and actually, Rodney, I'm looking forward to this conversation because before we even went live and hit record, these two were already getting into a pretty interesting conversation. Um, I don't know if we will bring that particular vein up, but... Uh, Let's, yeah, did you guys know. prepare your 30 seconds of like, here's here. my point. What's up? Oh, I'm sorry. I think we have a pretty good delay here. Um, 
uh, I wasn't sure if we could bring up the uh, the company that we were speaking about without uh, having some issues on our hands. Is that? Yeah. Let's 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 not name Should names. We... Yeah. If we okay. Get to there. We'll name names off air. <laughs> I don't want anyone to yeah, get right. in trouble. The only name you'll yeah. need to know today is Multi South Management Services, anyway. So there you I, mean, go. I think we're good. Boom. Yeah, I like it. <sighs> so, Dan, or do you do you or uh, Anthony? Do you have a question you want to start off with? We we kind of covered the bios here. I should have come uh, prepared, I guess. <laughs> As a moderator, I should have maybe come prepared with some questions. But mm -hmm. um, in fairness, I'm on vacation right now. I'm in a basement in Colorado um locked out of the world so here's my first question is let's just real quickly give you guys the floor for a minute and just talk us through the pros of your particular stance so dan that would be you're pretty pro in-house management brian you're pretty pro third-party management why should somebody vote for you because we're going to do this like a political campaign i think who's going first he said your name, so I'll defer to you. Um, Honestly, I think it would be nice to hear your pain points from third-party management so I could address them. That's probably, sure. a, that's sure. probably a good direction to yeah, go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I get, what do we get, 60 seconds? Clock starting. Um, so, However, first I'll, off, I'll stop you when the, I get bored of whatever you're saying. Yeah, yeah that sounds good, actually. Um, so first off, just to preface this uh, conversation, I don't believe that um, in-house is better than third party or vice versa. Uh, I think it is always 100% dependent on the individual and their business and their goals and uh, probably most importantly, their personality. And for me, my personality being the type of person that wants to control everything from the 50,000 foot level right down to everything that's happening on the ground. So, you know, that keeping everything in house just aligned perfectly with my uh, need to be uh, pretty much dictating the whole, uh, the whole business from top to bottom. And, um, and it was, it was basically a personality thing. Uh, the, th the catalyst that kind of brought me to that point was working with the first property management company that I did. And uh, there were a few things there that made it uh, not a good fit. Number one, my first property that I purchased was a six unit apartment building. So right off the bat, we're talking about a small number of units. And uh, that doesn't really incentivize another company uh, to put a ton of time and energy into your property if you only have six units. And this was a major value add reposition project that needed a lot of boots on the ground attention on a daily basis. It wasn't uh, a turnkey investment that was already uh, operating smoothly. This was a complete revamp. Uh, so for a third party to, to give that um, uh, that building the attention it needed to do well just wasn't realistic. And I should have known that, but it was the first deal and I didn't. So I did about six, seven months with this property management company, which actually ended up being um, a good experience because I got to learn a lot. I get to, I got to pretty much manage it with them for those six months and then decide, you know what, I'm going to take the reins and take it from here. Um, and then it just, uh, it made sense for me to continue on with that, with that business model going forward, even though I knew it was going to be more work for me, it wasn't going to be, uh, make really make sense financially in the short term, but in the long term, I knew that creating that type of business was going to be, um, able to provide me with the type of, um, business I wanted to end up with down the road because I look at, you know, Ken McElroy is kind of like my, my, uh, my end game. Uh, you know, he's got 10,000 plus units. Now he's always had the property management component in house because that's the background he came from. So I was always kind of attracted to that, to that format. But with that said, I know tons of guys who are killing it by outsourcing it as well. So, you know, I guess the question for the, for the viewers and listeners is, you know, what, uh, how can, you know, how can they determine what's best for them? What kind of things should they be asking themselves about their personalities and their business goals to decide which path is better for them, I guess. I, I would probably agree with that assessment because the, the difference between, let's say the, the type of. Uh, hey, wait, 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 wait. You're a moderator. We're moderating. Yeah, I know, but I'm I, I'm I'm segueing <laughs> into Brian here. I'm segueing okay, okay. into Brian. 
So for, for me, do not express your opinion, Rodney. I know it, it's, 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 it's hard for me Mr. to moderate. Your time is up. <laughs> but uh, for, for me, you know, that's not my forte. And so uh, I agree with what you say. It, it, it depends on a, the, the number of units you have, your particular circumstances, what your bent is and, and what your role is in the company. And so for me, uh, I, that's where I defer to third-party management like Brian. So, so that Brian, tell us the aspect of what you do. And as far as, you know, we understand that the management pretty much is, is, is management, you know, across the board, but why would somebody look at third-party management versus doing it in-house uh, for you? So Dan brought up a couple of good points. Um, you, for instance, your example of you had six units and you had third party management. That's not real efficient for them. So the fees that are going to come with that from a third party perspective are going to be higher, which creates a better opportunity for you to capture some of that return by doing it yourself. When we look at properties, people come to us and ask us something. If they show up with 24 units, I'm probably going to turn them away. And and part of that is because it's it's not efficient for us. To, like we're not going to make money because if we're charging Let's just say we charge 5% on that, which is our business model and something that size. And you do the math on that. We're not making a whole lot. So we don't have, we're not going to be able to dedicate that many resources to it like you could. So at scale is the most important thing. Um, and if, if there's not scale there, third party is going to be hard to be efficient for you. Like, in other words, it's not a good return on investment for you. Because you can probably get your arms around six units all day long. And to your point, it needs a lot of up close attention if you're doing a renovation project, something like that. Now, Dan, if you bought 550 units and it was a big rehab project, it would probably take up your entire day and some, right? Leaving you no time to do anything else. So we come into play when you're trying to get efficient. And you mentioned a guy whose name I'm not familiar with, but you said he went from basically zero units to 10,000 over time. Oh, you've never scenario, heard of Ken McElroy? Well, you gotta remember, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not real deep into the podcast or anything. I'm I'm just busy every day out there working, so I'm not. Hey, well, I'm not. I got to recommend a few books to you then, because he's got some good stuff. Right. Send them my direction. Uh, but you know, in that scenario, Ken probably did it right, did it in house, and it was probably part of his forte and his strength, like like Rodney was mentioning. Um, but I, you know, how long did that take? Like, I have it, no idea. Twenty year uh, I think he's been okay. in the business for at least since the '90s, if not late '80s, would be my guess. Yeah, Ken. Ken, for the audience, maybe that's not familiar with Ken McElroy. He's one of the guys in the rich, poor, rich dad, poor dad community. He wrote the ABCs of real estate investing. He's um, in that particular community, and so uh, yeah, I would say he's been actively investing for over twenty plus years at this point. So it took him probably okay. a long time to so, get to where he is. Right. So it's a long road. So things that can change that would maybe make you rethink in-house versus out uh, third-party management. Let's say there was a market scenario where, call it 2008, a lot of things came back out real cheap. You know, market reset, price are down, and you're trying to grow quickly. Well, if you're trying to go out and pick up assets while they're at this price level, well, then you may not have time to manage them all yourself. So the return for you is going to come on price per pound. So you're going out, you're buying them in this market. You've got investors that have money ready to go. They, maybe they don't trust the real estate. Or sorry, they don't trust stock market anymore. They got money and they want to throw at you as a syndicator and you're buying two, 3,000 units a year and you were not prepared to go manage those yourself because you need resources and you're going to have to have AP, you're going to have to have, you know, renovation guys. You got to have somebody that's going out and touching those things every at least once, twice a week, at least just like a regional manager like we would have. So that can really impact your decision between in-house and third party. It just timing scenarios, right? Now, if you're trying to grow slow, you're trying to do it all yourself. It's, it, it's better. I would tell you it is better because you get to see the assets, you get to know what's under control, and you get to have your arms wrapped around them. But at some point in time, you're going to have to give up some of that control if you want to be larger. And when you move to that third-party area, the biggest thing for you is going to be trust because you're used to knowing a lot about these assets on a daily basis and really being mm -hmm. able to dig in. So once you go and make that decision for third-party, you want to know that someone is doing something similar to that and if you know at that point it can't be you so you have to have a good relationship with this person 
you may want to start off slow with them, give them a few units or whatever as you start to turn this over and understand that the, the operations aren't changing as much as when you were running. If you feel confident, they're delivering some of the results, they're growing the revenue potential, they're controlling the expenses. There's a whole other set of like, conversation you and I started earlier of the little nuts, nuts and bolts of, you know, maybe we as a bigger purchaser get better prices on things, that kind of stuff. But I would mm -hmm. tell you the number one thing between third, third party management and in house is, is you're eventually going to have to give up control if you're going to grow. And so Ken probably has a department now that does very much what we do on a daily basis. And Ken's not doing it himself anymore. So it's, it's oh, weird. yeah. No, when I say in house management, just to be clear, I'm not saying that I'm going and personally collecting rent from people. I'm saying we hire employees no, no. as yeah. opposed to, you know, uh, so I'm not saying that like, you do it yourself. Research. Hiring employees? That, well, yeah. all that. Like, yeah. you've so got does hiring a third party uh, company, though. So, right. But you should be able to turn over a lot of things to that third party. Like, we should, we'll go out and hire. We don't really come and talk to you about hiring. We, we're trying to put the best person in the best spot. When it comes to the yeah. price negotiation, we're going to handle all that. Accounting, we'll turn over books to your account at a year end, that sort of stuff. So it's little things that, like I said, after you develop a relationship and you can trust that person, you can turn it over, free up your time to go do what makes you the most money. And I would tell you, in general, third-party management probably falls into a niche of, I don't have enough units yet to hand over third-party management, and then you hit us. And then you can probably move back into the, I have enough units that it's, economical now for me to bring this back in house and we're kind of that in between spot of hmm, interesting you need somebody before you're big enough so where do you think that oh i'm sorry i'm not i'm a guest i'm not supposed to ask questions no but i kind of want to ask okay. this, i'm really curious but, where do you, where do you think that point, point is here. as far as the units go between like uh, you know, well, maybe it's not number of units. Well, yeah, I guess it would be. Is there a, a specific number of units or a range where you think it makes sense to start to bring in third party? And then at, to your point where it makes sense to start to to uh, go back in house. Do you have some kind of ranges set up where, where there's where that makes sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it can be as early as 2000. But you made a comment earlier about personality. The people's portfolio yeah. we just took over today. They have 5,000 units and they used to manage them all in house. And they found out yeah. that as good as they thought they were at it, they were not very good at it. And so they have mm -hmm. since turned over all of their properties to third party managers because what they found was is they could do it, but they weren't great at it. And they were really good at finding new deals, handling all the other aspects of it the investor side, the syndication, everything. And they, what some people find out in this business is, on a day-to-day, -day, multifamily is a very hands-on, nitty-gritty, dirty business. Like, you know, and especially in 2020, everybody thinks everything can be managed via Zoom conference calls, internets, and emails. The reality is, is if you're not on your properties on a regular basis and you don't have somebody there overseeing the on-site staff, things can get sideways pretty quick. And you won't, you won't mm -hmm. notice, let's say you're an asset manager and you go, a good asset manager probably visits each property quarterly. Well, in three months, a lot of things can happen. I mean, in, in, in 2020 specifically, in three months, you had coronavirus. Let's say you needed to go and see all of your properties at once because coronavirus hit and you wanted to see what was happening. If you were in charge of that and you didn't have the full set of resources that you might need to have in place, you might it might be two months before you could get that property, or three months. And it, at that point in time, you might find out that your staff was too scared to come in and just close the doors for three months and wasn't really talking to them. I mean, that's yeah. happened with third party just because their regionals hadn't checked in and said, hey, how are y'all handling this? And so it's it, as much as we can do from afar and by chat and by email in this day and age, it's still a very hands on business. Yeah, I agree. What were you going to say, Anthony? You were going to look like you had a question queued up there. Yeah, I was going to point out here, I think the one of the important conversations that you guys are having here is about the fact that go the in-house route, you really need to be looking at it as you're starting a separate business. It is a separate entity and how it's going to operate is functionally very different than going and raising capital, finding deals, acquiring those deals, working with investors, right? So if you want to be successful, whether it's going in-house or third party, you need to understand that there's a difference between that and treat it as such. And I think 
maybe where we're having a little bit of, um, I think, a, a, a missed communication here is like really laying the foundation for what we mean by in-house management, specifically as it applies to, say, Dan's portfolio here in the cities where, you know, all the properties are intentionally grouped within a, a certain cluster so that the, the same property team can, can rotate through that. Um, one of the questions I would have is, thinking about customer service and being closest to the end user, like the companies that are closest to the end user are typically the ones that win. And the end user in this scenario is the tenant. So if you have a, pers a particular brand position that you're trying to own in the marketplace, how does that get lost or carried through when you're using a third party management company who might have like not be in a brand alignment with what you're trying to push? They are coming in with their own vision and vice versa for you, Dan, then, as you're working to hire people, because hiring is always the, the crux, I think, is you know, like finding good people to do the right work. How do you instill the right branding or company vision and then enforce that all the way through? Yeah, well, for me, I don't, um, you know, I don't try to necessarily instill my, my vision on other people. I try to find people that, ha that share the same uh, philosophies and moral values that I do so that I don't have to try to, you know, make them be like me. I want to find somebody who's morally and philosophically on the same page. Um, and then just mm -hmm. make sure that they have a clear understanding of what my business plan is so that they can execute it. Uh, and I think that's, that's huge, hugely important. Cause like you said, if you are too far removed from the, 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 the end user or the customer or whatever you want to call them, um, your 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 goal or your message can get lost in translation. That's true in just about any business. So, um, you know, that's one of the pieces I like about um, uh, being keeping that in house. Is I get to pick and choose exactly who's going to be having FaceTime with our residents and make sure that they they know what the business plan is and they know, uh, you know, philosophically. Or I shouldn't say that they know, but they are on the same page with me philosophically as far as like how we're going to execute the business plan. We're not going to cut corners. We're not going to nickel and dime people out of, uh, you know, deposits or try to screw people over here. We're, you know, we're going to do things the right way. We're going to make sure people have a, a nice, safe and, and clean place to live. And um, at the same time, we're going to, you know, get things done, make sure things are collected. And if things are not collected, we're going to boot them quickly, you know, no favors either. So just making sure that that, that, um, that uh, that vision is shared is, is hugely important. So. So that would probably be uh, one thing that differentiates between uh, in-house and third party. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Brian, you know, most of you guys, most of the property that you guys manage, um, you're putting you're putting personnel on property. Uh, like maintenance and uh, uh, the, the site manager, uh, leasing agent. Whereas Dan, do you do that or do you primarily do that yourself? And, and, and don't answer yet because I wanna get what Brian thinks about here as far as uh, you know that, that line between having somebody on site versus not having somebody on site. Well, in terms of on-site, that's that kind of goes back to the scale thing. Our preference is almost always to have somebody on site. We do have some properties that are run as a group, um, where it's a smaller unit count, but in totality, you know, there's enough to support a manager, an assistant, and an HVAC technician type guy. Uh, so we will have some not have on site. But generally speaking, most properties are going to run well with people there every day, watching over them. But it just doesn't always the business plan just doesn't always support. It. So. Um, Yes, that's, that's our preference, Rodney, is to have that, but just not always feasible. Uh, one thing to address, Dan, you mentioned about the branding, the consistency. That can be a big thing for some of our customers. And in a sense, you're always going to be co-branding with somebody like us. I don't know too many property managers that are of, of any size that, that don't want to kind of sort of put in their box. It doesn't have to be 100% like we do. Um, like it does, if you come to us and you say, I've got these properties, I want to do the following, we pretty much always work with our customers to make sure that their vision is delivered and that we're on the same page as them. But it's, in essence, you're always kind of co-branding with us because they're gonna, we're going to be there to answer on a daily basis for what's happening and you know who's been kicked out and who's not, et cetera. But uh, 
you know, and if and service orders are done on time, that sort of thing. So you're going to have somebody with you on that ride, and hopefully that's a good partnership. And you could say, hey, we at our level, let's call it Kruger Company, have these ethics and these values, and we feel that MultiSouth shares those, and we work together to make sure that product is delivered to our tenant base. Uh, but you will always have better control over the things you mentioned if you keep it all in-house. Uh, there's no way for me to say you wouldn't. I mean, that's just the way it would be. Uh, you would have the ability to hire who you wanted, push the directives you wanted, and if they're not on the same page, and you can get rid of them, and you're never really worried about it because you probably have a lot of contact with them during that process. Um, Rodney, you were remind me you you were asking a little bit about on site, but there was more to that question, wasn't there? Well, it was more along the lines you know, where you referenced earlier uh, about. Uh, there, there's a there's a line between self-managed that you bring in third party and then you transition back and and the not so much of the transitioning back but the where is the line in uh, whether you can afford to put somebody on site or not I think that was what I was getting at you know it, it Dan you probably see this if you've got a smaller unit count and you have Age, it's an aged property and it hasn't gone through renovation and you get to the point where you're paying a lot of money to have third party guys come in because if I've got a guy who can generally do most things on site, call it shower head repairs, small plumbing repairs, HVAC certified, that sort of thing, you are, you call out one HVAC tech to come refill a unit, you know, Freon, and he's doing that for 20 units on a property during each summer, probably going to charge you between 150 and 250 for each one of those units. At some point in time, it becomes economical for you, and you've got to look at your expenses in-house to say, I, I've got enough expense at this place to keep it running on a daily basis that I'd rather pay a guy $22 an hour uh, and maybe cover his insurance or send him to the market and give him a stipend for insurance, something like that, and, and pay him, and you're going to come out ahead. Just because, I mean, that's just economics. If you've got third-party labor versus in-house labor, it's just way cheaper, but you know, you've got to keep him busy eight hours a day, most likely. Or you got to have enough properties to keep them busy eight hours a day, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's uh, a lot of it comes down to, you know, just you know looking at what repairs and what maintenance you are actually spending the most on. Because if you have just a bunch of new, brand new Class A units, you're not going to be spending money on the same things that the guy who has the mid 60s garden style buildings is spending money on. So and those might be two very different technically skilled people. You know, one might be just a general handyman who's just unclogging sinks, whereas the other guy in the class A building might be, you know, an HVAC uh, specialist, right? So there's those are two very different uh, people and they're two very different um, types of labor. So, you know, in one case, it might make sense to have a, a full-time employee that you pay 20 bucks an hour to. In the other case, it might not. So I think it, it it's really dependent on the portfolio and uh, the type of properties that are managed, in my opinion. So, And, and honestly, you, you said Class A, but we have properties that we've rehabbed where went back in with vinyl plank, went back in with all new HVAC equipment, all new faucets and fixtures. And so by the time we were done with it, it might be five years before any heavy lifting has to be done. At that yeah. point in time, you can go down to one maintenance man, like you said, more mm -hmm. of a generalist. He's not a specialist. And if he can't do something, we're replacing carpet. We've got a third party vendor that's got good pricing. They can come in and replace yeah. the carpets and then they need two or three years. They're going to, we're going to hire a third party to clean the carpet between turns anyway. And so it doesn't even have to be class A. It just really depends on, like you said, each asset and just what the needs mm -hmm. are. And that's what it. So, you could have a 200 unit property that you really don't need on-site staff. You're probably going to want leasing, but you may not need, need that much maintenance. You might need a grounds guy, but you're probably yeah. going to have a landscaping contract for most of that, and they can clean up when they're there. So every mm -hmm. property is unique, and it just depends on what its current state is. Yeah, I agree. And so, Brian, on your guys' side of things, do you have an in-house construction wing that's going in and handling the, the renovations and the, the repositions? And do you guys focus within like light lifting or pretty heavy lifting? It sounds like you guys went in and did all new HVACs. So that's a pretty heavy lift. But how do you guys balance that between bringing outside contractors in? So we have a little bit of both. Uh, 
I mean, we're never going to go pave a parking lot for gas, but we have enough good contracts, or sorry, contacts within the markets we're in that know what good pricing is, who's got it, and if we keep them busy with steady work, we're going to get good bid prices. We usually always get a couple of bids anyway, just to make sure everybody's staying on it. Um, but we were talking about light stuff. Uh, we do enough work now. Uh, we were we had crews that came in and did flooring for good prices because it was easier because they could get in and do it cheaply. And we're doing enough work now between all of our terms and all of our properties between our 12,000 units that vendors are coming to us with prices that are as good as we could get it done by hiring our own crews. And so I'm actually able to use big name brand people with just good pricing from us for us that wouldn't be retail pricing that it's, I can just let them come in and do their job and be efficient. It's kind of like hiring a third party manager. Like I used to do the floors in house, but I got big enough that I was doing enough volume that I can now call Sherwin Williams and say, come do all the floors at this place and do it at this price. And this is what I'm going to pay you for the flooring and the plank. And they say, love to have the business. Thank you for the opportunity. And they get it done. So that frees up my guys who have a larger skill set to go in and do other things. They can go in and do electrical and plumbing, that maybe I, you just can't really get done too cheaply, even if you've got good volume. I mean, we can get good prices with electrical and plumbing, but it's always going to be cheaper with our guys in house. So, you know, those guys now have more freedom to go out, or more, I should not say freedom, but bandwidth to go get other stuff done. Um, if you don't need too much done, you can utilize third party vendors for floors and let your maintenance guys paint on turns, as long as it's not too many. Uh, if they're turning four, five, six a month, you know, baby per guy, it's going to go and paint. He can probably get that done. Uh, but, you know, to a point, like Dan said earlier, if you've got aged equipment and your HVAC guys are constant or your maintenance guys are constantly doing HVAC and other things, then they don't have time to go paint units. So you're probably going to be looking for a third party vendor that can come in and do that for you. And you probably use them in a lot of places and they give you decent prices. But it's, it's Anthony, it's a little bit of both. It's more of a matrix than it is a one line item sort of thing. Um, we try to do as much with our crews as we can. But, you know, there's always good third party vendors as long as you trust them and you give them an opportunity to do good work. If you can keep those kind of third party vendors busy, uh, they'll generally work with you and give you good prices. And Dan probably runs into that too. Uh, I mean, he's probably got enough units that he's probably got a short list of people he calls. They know what prices Dan needs to get to get it done. And they go and do good work and he trusts them to come get it done. Yeah, I like to try to have three vendors for just about everything in a perfect world. Three guys that I know are um, honest, trustworthy, priced right, um, because you never know. And this, especially when it comes to maintenance and construction stuff these days, it's um, it, it, people will just flake uh, without notice right now. It's just it's really tough to find really good quality. Um, you know, guys in that handyman field. So we try to have you know three painters, three floors um three carpet guys you know basically try to have three for everything so that if we get into a bind we need something done quickly we've got lots of backup options so yeah and so that actually segues nicely into another question that i wanted to get to which is on the topic of accountability right when the project isn't going as expected it's running over budget or like the the vacancies are does. running too high and it always does exactly how do you how do you hold um, accountability at both from an in-house perspective, but then also from the third party perspective. Cause like, you know, for Brian, if uh, you're managing all 5,000 of our units and we're like, we're not happy with you, how do we hold you accountable short of just taking our business elsewhere, which can be very traumatic and um, very cost intensive and time intensive. So, you know, you mentioned something earlier today about personalities of in-house and third party management. Uh, I used to be a broker in a, in a different world. Uh, I'll tell you, like I told everybody else, the point of having a broker and having a third party manager is you can fire us whenever you want and pass that blame right on, on, on to us if you need to have an answer for your investors. So there's always that backup option. If you don't want to have to have to have the buck stop in your office, you can just go hire a third party and fire a third party, and that's always an option. When it comes to accountability for us, you know, we should be in good contact with you throughout the process. Uh, anybody that's ever done construction, I heard Dan say something about it a second ago, is Nothing ever gets finished on time. Nothing ever gets finished exactly like it's supposed to. We're always trying to deliver exactly what we would tell you. Uh, and we're more of a under promise, over deliver sort of people. But there's tons of people out there that are over promise and under delivers and just constantly want to sell. You know, they're selling you on 
oh, we're going to have, because they want the business up front. For me, I, and this goes to our company in general, we don't have a salesperson that goes out and says, you should hire multi-sell because I don't want anybody out there saying something that I'm not hearing or I don't agree with because again, I'm more of an under promise over deliver, make you happy because you know, I've been there. I, I, when somebody tells me something's going to be done at this price at this time, and then they're three months off and they're twice the budget that I gave them, it is maddening. And there's not a whole lot of recourse other than let me just keep being frustrated with you or eventually take my business elsewhere. And so we like to have a long-term perspective um, with all of our clients. So I'd rather give you the honest truth as soon as possible and, and not sugarcoat it because that's, that's the only way I know how to operate. Um, it's just, it's just easier that way, in my opinion, than try, trying to constantly come up with excuses for why you're behind. I'd rather just say, Hey, just so you know, we, and it's happened to us recently when coronavirus hit, we were supposed, supposed to deliver a bunch of units and for about three weeks, Lowe's, HD, Coburn's, our local and Youngbloods and All Right and everybody else could not get a fridge in stock for the life. We still of, can't get them up here. And everybody just didn't have anything. And so we couldn't really move people into these renovated units without a fridge. You just can't. So we did. We sent a guy around with truck, bought everything off the serving floor he could find. multi south bought everything in sight. We said, we'll figure out who's going to get the bill later. Um, and... My, I just told my cut the day I started finding out about it. I told my customers that had stuff under renovation. I said, I told you I was going to have 15 units for you this month. I'm going to have them, but they're not going to have fridges and I can't move somebody in. And I'm sorry. And I know you may or may not believe me, but we don't have fridges and I just can't get a hold of them. But back to the sales point, we've got people from our, from HD and Lowe's saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got them in the warehouse. They're going to ship Friday. Friday rolls around. No, 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 no. They're going to be there on Monday because they're sales and that's what they know. And they're just trying to keep the invoice open. And they want to get the sale done in the end. So they're just doing what they know how to do. And so, you know, we're not real salesy. We're just going to, we're going to give you the un, unsugarcoated, just straight up truth. And so it's a long-term perspective for us. I'm not looking to just get as many people under management as I can. And if they last, they last fine. I'd rather have Rodney show up one day and say, I've got a hundred units for you to manage by the time it's done. Hopefully I've got 3000 of Rodney's units. And if one day he says, you know, it's finally efficient for me to take this away for you. I'm going to say, man, I don't think you should, but I understand. And I've enjoyed growing with you. And I'm, I'm, thank you for trusting us with your business. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, I like that answer. That's a good... Sorry, Sorry, go ahead, Anthony. I, there must be some delay like you're talking about there, Dan. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, I'm floating in uh, just terrible Wi-Fi, I think. So I apologize for that, guys. Um, I think that's a, that's a really good answer, Brian. It's hard when you're accountable to do a thing and you're working with salespeople and you know their incentives are very different than your incentive of what you're trying to accomplish. And so, Dan, pivoting to you then, how do you look at accountability from an in-house property management perspective? Um, what do you do if something isn't going to plan and um, how, do you, how do you hold accountability down through the line? Yeah, well, I mean... Uh, Brian just summed up the last uh, two weeks for me with, you know, hunting for fridges. I just had to buy a bunch from uh, Iowa the other day, actually, because we just, I couldn't find anything here in Minnesota, which is ridiculous. But um, I mean, to that point with, in this business, almost nothing goes to plan and almost nothing comes in on budget. So, you know, there's always kind of that constant issue of, okay, what I wanted to happen isn't quite happening the way I wanted, you know, and, and so that's that's going to kind of always be there. And the way I I look at it is, um, uh, if there's good communication between me and my property manager, uh, that's all that matters, right? Because it's it's very rare that a renovation project goes uh, finishes on time, on budget, and there were no surprises. It's very 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 rare. And so my thing is, we never know what's going to what's going to happen, right? We've got our plan and we've got our budget and we're going to go into this with the best of intentions, but there's always going to be a surprise. So uh, was that surprise communicated uh, immediately or did someone stick their head in the sand? And, you know, that's that's basically what it comes down to me. It, what it comes down to with me is communication. Are we communicating in real time about what's going on? And, you know, are we looking for help? Are we, are we talking to each other about what kind of roadblocks we're hitting or, um, 
you know, are we holding back bad news? And if, if there's good communication and we're getting phone calls when things are, are going a little bit sideways and we need to pivot and readjust, then, then we're good because stuff's never going to go to plan. But it's, it's when there's a lack of communication that there's a problem. Um, and in the past when I've had that, I've just nixed them because I had to go through a few property managers that, um, uh, before I found my, my rock star, Michael, um, but, uh, but yeah, communication is paramount. If there's good communication, mm-hmm. then you can make your way through just about anything, I think. Agreed. So at the beginning of the, the show, Dan, you mentioned the fact that uh, whether you go in-house management or third party really comes down to your personality type. So let's take this to the beginning for an investor who maybe doesn't know yet. They're on the fence. They're thinking, maybe I have the personality for in-house. Maybe I have the personality for third party. I don't know. How can they evaluate their skill set, strengths, and personality to say, you would be better going over here with third party management, or you actually should think about going in-house and just building that up from the ground? I think Brian might might answer that one better for uh, than I would, but I'll give it a, a shot here because I can at least speak for myself. <laughs> uh, I know myself and I know why it was a good fit for me. So that, that might provide some value for people, but I'd say, you know, if you don't mind uh, doing things, uh, you know, putting in more work on the front end, and if you don't mind uh, taking on the, the, the burden of essentially, you know, HR, right? You know, you're hiring people, or you're dealing with people problems. You're not just managing properties; you're you're managing people. That's a whole new dynamic. Uh, if you don't mm-hmm. mind all those things, um, or maybe you're willing to to put up with them for the for the benefits, then it can be a good move because it could keep your costs down, especially in the early early years when you've got less units. Uh, it does provide you with a greater level of control. Um, but it also provides you with a greater level of responsibility too. So for those who don't shy away from a lot of work, but want to try to keep their price points as low as possible and try to maintain a lot of control, like if you're a micromanager and you just need to be in everything, um, that might be an indicator that, that you might be, uh, uh, the type of person who would respond better to keeping it in house. Um, but I think that I'm kind of the minority. I'm not necessarily the norm. The more I network with people in this industry, I think Anthony, you can vouch for me on this one. Uh, it by far, it's more common for, for guys to outsource the management, uh, to, to, to third parties. So we're kind of the, the minority out there, but, but I think those kind of personality yeah. traits, um, are something that you should be aware of. It, and to that point, I think a lot of people, when they get into real estate investing or syndicating, they, they're interested in the real estate, the numbers, the network and the investors. They're not really interested in so much in the HR and the, the construction management side of things. That's a whole different skill set. And so I guess turning the question to you, Brian, what would make for a really bad customer for you where you're like, yeah, working with you is just not good for us and it's not good for you? <laughs> Because I'm sure I'm sure that well, happens, and you've probably had to maybe fire people before, right? Customers. Yeah, we have, but it's not always for the reasons you think. Um, but there's some good examples. You mentioned some of the things to go about skill set. Uh, one I would one big defining characteristic of third party or in house, I would tell you is, do you have a very wide skill set or do you have a very narrow skill set? Because it it takes it's mm-hmm. many hats. If you want to do that in house, he mentioned it: construction management, HR. Uh, I mean not even structure management, just personnel management, all those things that we do on a daily basis. I mean, you you have a unit burned down in the middle of the night. That could that could derail every if you're in the middle of trying to buy some other project and you have something burned down and you've got to stop everything you're doing, it could just be a time issue too. So you gotta have so many more hats if you're gonna be in house management or you've got to have people hired to do and wear those hats. And that's a that's a numbers game again. Um, in terms of customers we have fired for what you probably think is it's a bad fit it's folks that do they they're micromanaging they want to know everything about it we have folks so once you turn over so you fired me basically (laughs) you seem like a nice guy but you know when you turn over third-party management there's actual i mean there's lines that you really that really can't be blurred uh and you mentioned hr so when you hire us all the employees are technically employees of multi staff and yep. we carry their work comp insurance, we do their health insurance, et cetera. And if you've got a owner that wants to also give direction to those employees and ask them to do things or send them money on the mm-hmm. side, 
start to blur the lines of who the employer is. And that can actually be a big risk for somebody like Dan, because if Dan's paying this guy money, an extra bonus on the side, then all of a sudden he's kind of an employer. And if that person gets injured or they've done something at his direction, then there's a liability for Dan at that point. And it's the question of, do they fall underneath our liability coverage? Et cetera. So there's all that little nuance of once you are in the management business, you have all these other things you have to think of. So we have, we've had some customers that, they wanted to be that involved. They wanted to give that direction. And we'd said, hey, look, we like you. You're a nice guy. And we enjoy managing your properties, but we're co-managing it with you. And I don't think that's a great fit. So we're going to have to basically turn this back over to you. And that guy took it in-house. And he did it because it, you know, it was a little bit more effort for him. But he was already so involved with it on day-to-day that – and he only had a couple of properties. It was a retirement deal for him. You know, he had 400 units total or something like that, and he retired from the police force. And just a really nice guy and knew what he was doing, but you know, just had so much time on his hands that he got into it. And we just, you know, he's given direction to our regionals. And we're like, you can't, you can't be doing this. So we think it's best to, you know, you go ahead and take them in house. And we've had other ones that are just too small. And we said, look, you know, it's not efficient. We will give them recommendations on somebody that might be more efficient for them. Um, but you know, if if you've just got to have your hands on everything, you're gonna wear your property management guy. Out. And they're probably mm-hmm. gonna get they they just it's just not a good fit. But eventually if that guy wants yeah, to get big, he's either gonna have to hire more people in house or he's gonna have to hand it over. And that was that sort of trust, mm-hmm. control and numbers game that you eventually it, you run into you run out of bandwidth. There's only so much yarn on the spool and that guy's gotta give up something somewhere at some point in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think regardless of which way you end up going, if you decide, hey, in house is my way go for it go 100 percent into it own it if you're going to go the third party property manager route you need to trust them to do their job and give them the rope the bandwidth to do so if you're just bringing on third party management to micromanage them you're doing it all wrong and you might as well have just gone in-house to, from the beginning that's right so guys i think we're reaching the top of the hour but i do want to hit uh one more question, which I think it could be really helpful in terms of next steps. If somebody, Dan, says, okay, I want to go in-house, what's their next steps? Brian, if somebody wants to go third party, what's their next steps? Dan, why don't you go? Uh, yeah, well, I guess, I mean, it depends on the um, the size of the portfolio as well. If this person says, I want to go in-house and they've got a handful of units uh, and they have the ability to uh, I guess even if you have a full-time job with a handful of units, you could still pretty much manage it yourself. I would recommend that they they do it themselves. You know, obviously get educated on uh, all the laws in your area. Make sure that you're doing things properly. But you know, try to do as much as you can hands-on first if you've just got a couple of units, so that you can learn the ropes. And then when you actually do have to hire an employee, a property manager that you're going to employ, you know what uh, skill sets to be looking for. You know, you you want to have a really good understanding of of the job that you're hiring for, so you know. Um, you know, who a good candidate would be. Um, so I'd say education first. You obviously want to make sure you, you understand all the laws in your area as it pertains to, um, uh, you know, being a landlord. And then, uh, you know, get your hands dirty if you've got a small portfolio and then look at bringing somebody on board. You know, where that makes sense, it's 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 different for everybody. Um, you know, the general rule of thumb that gets tossed around, Brian, maybe you can uh, fine tune this a little bit is, you know, basically a, a property manager and a maintenance guy for every 100 units. Um, like we said before, that might be, um, you know, that, that might change if they're all brand new builds or if they're all really old. But, you know, that's kind of the high level path I would I would suggest people take. And that's just because um, that's kind of the path I took. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the most efficient one, but that, that's what I did and it seemed to work. So... I agree with Dan. Uh, I think everything he just said is spot on. Uh, the hundred units, man, every property is special. Every property is unique. Everything you you'll get in there and you'll know, like you said, once you get your hands dirty, you'll know what they need, um, and mm-hmm. and you'll figure it out. So um, it's it's hard to put. It's more of an art than it is a science in that regard. Uh, next steps: if you're looking for a third party management company, we have folks that we've never met. They've called us, said, "Here's the property. I need you to take it over." And let's have let's have a phone call. I wouldn't recommend that personally. Um, I would never do that. Go meet your property manager. Uh, ask for references. Talk to people 
that they're managing for currently and see if they have those items you're worried about, whether it be communication, whether it be price, whether it be just whatever bothers you and what you're concerned about. Uh, and make sure you're on the same page because every property manager in this business is different. Uh, and certain people are better at, at some areas than they are at others. They might be property managers that you, you hire and they don't ever want to talk to you again. They're going to send you reports and please don't try and get in our way. And there may be other ones that aren't great at reporting, but they always deliver a great product and the property always looks wonderful. I would go drive a property they manage and see how it looks and go drive more than one. Um, just as a, a defense mechanism for the third party industry. We're not always in charge of a property because at the end of the day, if the owner refuses to fund something or refuses to be, a, and we've we fired people for this, if you won't work with us to make your property perform well and, and be in the condition it needs to be to keep your tenants safe and happy, then we're probably don't want to work with you. And we've, we've wrapped up relationships that way too and said, hey, you know, you sold this one, we enjoyed working with you. Probably not a good fit going forward. So there's always that limitation. And that guy probably should be managing in-house if he wants to be that type and run it that way. Um, but, you know, in terms of looking at third-party management, go talk to them, go meet them, get to know them, uh, and ask for those references because you need to you need to have a list of what your what's important, what are your goals, what's important to you. It could be that the budget and hitting those numbers is the most important thing in the world to you. And if, if you want them to forego some improvements because it's going to hit the budget and they're not that kind of company, you need to know that up front. Um, if they, we have kind of a, an ethos that we talk to folks about. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very hands-on business, no matter how you look at it and how telemarketing communication folks want to be in 2020. We don't want any of our regional 